Let's face it, business technology is frustrating and complex. So how do you make sure it works for your team? To make IT right, start the discussion at go-domain.com. You're listening to Discussions by Domain, a podcast for business leaders. Our discussions may be with people you've probably heard of before, but the majority of our guests are in the trenches, professionals like you and I, with the same challenges and struggles of keeping up in the Northeast. They're implementing strategies, overcoming hurdles. They're leading the fastest growing businesses in our region. My name is Anthony DeGraw, Director of Partnerships at Domain Computer Services and the host of this show. When I'm not talking with business leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of Domain and the ups and downs of our own growth journey as we intend to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. So welcome to another episode of Discussions by Domain. I am your host, Anthony DeGraw, and today we have the pleasure of interviewing Victor Cardona. He is the Senior Network Executive at Comcast. Victor, welcome to the show. Hey, Anthony. Happy, uh, happy to be here. Thank you for having us. Looking forward to talking here. Yeah, I think we're going to get a lot for our audience here with the expertise that you have in, in your specific area. Hey, Victor, before we get started here, can you give the audience a little background on yourself and what uh, you guys are up to at Comcast today? Yeah, no, I appreciate it, buddy. So, you know, my name is Victor Cardona. I've been in the uh, tech industry uh, for going on 15 years now. I can't believe it. Been here, you know, like I said, 15 years been at a host of different companies, mostly in the telecommunications and infrastructure space. Recently at a, uh, at a large cable company here at Comcast, doing business development, uh, marketing, and a little sales here. Ma- happily married, have three kids, a beautiful baby girl. I'm a CrossFit enthusiast, so uh, definitely- There we go. Uh, yeah. I try. I, I get it, get it right sometimes. I mean, I wish my, uh, my waistline matched the, my, my workout habits, but I do eat a lot. <laughs> so we are we are working on that on that piece, but you know, really happy to be here and looking forward to a talk with you guys. I I love what you guys are doing over at Domain. You guys are forward thinkers, innovators in the industry, and we're happy to be uh, collaborating here with you guys. Appreciate that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna dive into the three areas where you are helping your customers get the best results, the most results, and the challenges that you're working on for them. So, so I have a note here that network diversity is a big area where you're helping the CIOs that you're working with. Why don't you dig into that for us? Yeah, for sure. So everybody knows the, the old legacy telephone companies, right? When it comes to network infrastructure, you had like the Verizons, the AT&Ts, the CenturyLinks, the Ilex, all great companies in their own respect. But, you know, they've owned the, uh, the loop or the last mile and a lot of the, the fiber and, and infrastructure, the copper that's underground for the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. What the cable companies started doing back in like the 50s, 60s, and you know, the 50s and 60s is, hey, let's uh, build in coax, right? It would be diverse from all of the, uh, the legacy ILEX. So from a diversity standpoint, we're building in private infrastructure for our customers and building diverse networks, right? And it's built for obviously network resiliency, performance, and obviously with today's competitive landscape, these customers can't afford any type of downtime. I think we're starting to see where the, the executives at these companies are really noticing the importance of a, a diverse network, right? They can't just put all their eggs in one basket anymore. So these cable companies and our cable companies are uniquely positioned to offer that diversity to our customers, right? Because of that historic, you know, like, as I mentioned, the, the old phone company model, they've obviously owned all of the infrastructure in the past. Yeah, makes sense. And then the next area that I want to talk about, we talk a lot here at Domain. I don't think a lot of the the smaller, mid-sized businesses that we work with think enough about until a big natural disaster like Sandy comes on or you have a terrorism act or, or whatnot, this disaster recovery. So tell me how you're helping customers specifically with disaster recovery and their cloud initiatives. Well, listen, man, I mean, you guys are doing an amazing job. I mean, obviously, we, we share a ton of customers together and clients here in, uh, in the Northeast. And I see the work that Domain is doing, and we're, we're privileged to be working with you. But as you guys know, I mean, 
cloud is really changing the way business operates, especially in the IT space. Companies are moving a lot of their data intensive apps and workflows into the cloud. They expect these resources, right, and these apps to perform if they were in their office, right? They don't want delays, interruptions, downtime. And what we're doing and what Comcast is doing specifically is providing Ethernet-based services over our fiber platform to seamlessly integrate a lot of their off-premise resources into this chain, right? So their virtual servers or storage, you know, obviously business continuity DR, it acts like these off-site applications are on their premise because of these dedicated connections. So we're leveraging our Ethernet-based services to facilitate secure direct access between all the major hyperscalers, right? AWS, Amazon, IBM Cloud. Obviously, what you guys are doing at Domain, we can connect directly to your infrastructure, right? And we don't, we can, we don't have to go over the public internet. So we're providing low latency, secure private access to all these apps. And as mentioned, we're bypassing the internet. So there's a ton of benefits to it. But as, as you mentioned, man, a lot of people are talking about it now. And I think it's starting to come down the fence. It's not just enterprise anymore. It's more in mid-market SMB. Everybody's starting to see that. Obviously, you know, we're here in Jersey, so you know what all the la- you know the, the the recent hurricanes and and storms that we've had, we, we've we've been impacted, right? So I think that companies are starting to wake up now, and that's why I'm glad to be working with uh, Domain and what you guys are doing because you guys are doing an amazing job in that space. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate that. And the final area here in terms of how you guys are helping people is we have a note on reducing operating expenses. Tell me how, and uh, Domain just went through this where we're really digging in with clients across VoIP services, cloud services, and we're typically finding areas where expenses could be reduced. Tell me how you guys are looking at that from a Comcast perspective. Sure. So a couple different areas. You mentioned some of them, right? So VoIP, right? Moving some of uh, or moving your your phone infrastructure off into the cloud, right? Giving it to some hosted provider who can essentially manage the whole thing for you. It's an operational expenditure. If something happens to the phone, you know, a a phone gets shipped overnight. Everything's fully managed. Everything's in the cloud. It's a lot easier than having a premise-based system where you're paying hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to maintain it, right? So that that's definitely an area where where Comcast helps. Also, from a from an operational standpoint, because we're building in our fiber, right? We we absorb a lot of that cost, right? Or you know, to build out fiber, to build out coax. And what we do is uh, we typically ask for a particular term, to a particular contract date, but we provide that infrastructure for, uh, from an operational standpoint, right? So there's other technologies that you would have to basically pay to run your fiber. So it's a large upfront cost to, to run your own fiber. And, you know, we would manage that for you, right? If you don't have the expertise on hand or the budget to even buy, you know, the, these large pe- these large pieces of gear to maintain your own fiber network, we would do that for you. Another big piece is because we own the network and we're building it in, we usually do see a reduction in cost from a monthly uh, services standpoint, right? Where we see some of our competitors providing lower bandwidth at higher rates, because we own the fiber, we're diverse, uh, we're usually able to reduce our operational expenditures by absorbing that build-out cost and providing yeah, more bandwidth for less because, you know, we're able to do that. So those are a couple of the ways that we're, that we're reducing op, uh, OPEX, obviously building these private networks, displacing old MPLS networks, um, and we own the last mile. So we, we do have that advantage. Yeah, dive into that a little bit with me, the the last mile. I This is a concept I've heard a lot about. I understand it. I'm just wondering from the provider standpoint, from the Comcast standpoint, what does that look like and what does that mean to the customer overall? The last mile is usually that piece of glass from the phone pole into the customer uh, DMARC. If I'm domain, right, inside of a multi-tenant building, right, and I'm at suite 200, there's a couple wires coming into that building for connectivity purposes. Usually, you know, the ILEC, the phone company in the area, in our area, it's Verizon. It could be AT&T or CenturyLink on the West Coast from a phone company standpoint. You also have to, or the cable company, right? And that's usually us, right? Because we're the largest in the, in, the, in the country. But you have other cable companies out there who bring that piece of fiber, coax, or glass into the building. So that's considered the last mile. And what happens is, you know, we're one of only a handful of providers who actually own that piece of glass that goes into the building, what other companies are doing is they're reselling Verizon, 
right? So there's or or any anyone else who owns their last mile. A lot of the you know there's five to ten other companies I could think off the top of my head who don't own that last mile. So what they do is they basically resell other services, right? So they'll they'll use a Verizon and AT and T essentially like a Comcast, a Light Path to come in and resell those services. So it's important for the customer to know who that last mile provider is, especially in in questions of diversity. I deal with a lot of larger financial companies who may be leveraging two or three other different providers, but they may all be using the same last mile or local loop to get into that building. So what Comcast does is we come in and provide a completely diverse network on our own last mile. Heaven forbid anything happen to that conduit or that piece of glass or fiber that's coming into that building. Gotcha. No, it makes a lot of sense. And and thank you for that explanation. I think people are going to get something out of that and truly understand what that means and who is in control of the last mile for them and the services that they're using. Sure. Um, so where I'd like to go next is the, you know, where are you seeing this industry change? Obviously, you're working with larger organizations, enterprises, mid-sized businesses, multi-locations across the country. What are the, you know, the top three areas you are seeing change within your your specific industry here in this space? There's a couple areas. Obviously, technology is changing right now at a rapid pace, but IT budgets aren't really changing, right? So how do we fit new technologies in on yesterday's budget, right? So that that's always key. How do we implement new technologies on yesterday's budget, right? So trying to find a way to shift technology budgets, it's always, it's always a challenge, right? Adoption of cloud-based apps and third-party providers. And because of the shift in technology and what we're seeing, because of the outsourcing of cloud, more people on the network, um, bigger files, right? Images, video, there's definitely a need for more bandwidth, like, you know, huge amounts of bandwidth, more data. I mean, it's all really exploding right now. So it improves speeds and performance. I mean, I think those are the the key areas I'm seeing from a telecom infrastructure network standpoint. That's where I'm really seeing the uh, the change in IT. Gotcha. And talk to me a little bit about digital transformation initiatives. Where do you see this and, and how do you see it? Yeah. So, I mean, we're starting to get exposed a little bit more here and there. I mean, as you know, man, and I'm sure you're seeing it a lot in, in your space, businesses are becoming more digital. The application of technology to processes, products, you know, assets to improve efficiency, right? And enhance the customer value, manage risk, uncover new, you know, monetization platforms. But we're noticing, not surprisingly, right? Making digital a center part of your enterprise strategy requires everyone to really undertake a journey to that next phase, right? So, I mean, from our standpoint, I'll give you just an idea, right? You think about Netflix, Right, you think about Blockbuster. Companies who are more forward thinking in their digital transformation are gonna outlast everyone else, right? And, and we're starting to see it as a competitive strategy now. I mean, if you're not digital first, you're, you're just not gonna be around, right? You're not gonna be in business. And I mentioned Blockbuster because everybody knows who Blockbuster, the old brick and mortar stores. You know, now you're seeing Netflix, you know, you're thinking about the Ubers, right? They don't own anything, they don't own any, any of the cars. They're just providing the platform for us to, uh, or make it easier for us to commute and to move around. We got to think digital first, mobile first, app first, and make things a lot easier for customers to consume data and consumers, right? B2B, B2C, for us to com- consume data. Yeah, and just run your, your businesses overall. I mean, we're seeing that it's, and you're seeing it too, it's no longer just IT having the conversation. It's IT, sales, marketing, product, service delivery. Everybody needs the speed and they don't necessarily have it or, or being able to communicate why that's valuable to them. Oh, 100%, 100%. All right, and then the final thing with all of this is obviously we're always balancing security and productivity, right? Speed and security. Uh, tell me what Comcast is doing in this security space for all of this. Yeah, sure. So at Comcast today, we have a DDoS mitigation platform, right? As part of our network services product portfolio, right? And what DDoS is, it's it's a protection against DDoS attacks, right? Or volumetric flood attacks, right? So what we do is on top of our internet services, we're providing the detection and the alerting of these attacks. And we're mitigating these attacks by sending the, uh, the infected traffic to our scrubbing centers, right? And then obviously that traffic, the infected traffic gets removed and the, and the legitimate traffic flows through. 
So it, it basically detects DDoS attack traffic. Um, it could include volumetric, flood, TCP, state, application layer, and, and it alerts the customer when something's happening, essentially. So we're seeing a lot of that in uh, specifically, I mean, really all over the place, but I'm starting to see a lot of that in schools, right? It could be a disgruntled student or an old student or maybe a, <laughs> an old teacher, but we're starting to see a lot of that. And, you know, we're, we're providing and we're initiating the migration automatically on or after the requested uh, attack. So from a security standpoint, that, that's really the, to the extent that, that we offer it. I mean, we lean on people like you guys, right, Domain, and, and the, the good stuff you guys are doing in the space to, to really enhance and design a, a security platform that's going to that's gonna protect your customers. I mean, we, we, we heavily rely on companies like you to do that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, very, very good stuff, and I, and I appreciate all of this. One last note on Comcast, and I, I saw this recently, but the build-out of this new facility and uh, campus, I guess you would call it, in Philadelphia, even some gaming going in there. Any insights you can give the audience about what's going on in Philly? Yeah, so we're, I, I can't give much, but for, for what I can give, I mean, we just spent about $50 million in South Philly, right in that gaming kind of uh, area. I'm sure you've been to a couple of games and right in the Xfinity Live area. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a really cool, really cool arena. It's gonna be called Fusion Arena, but it's gonna be the nation's first video gaming arena. So I mean, I, I don't get it. I don't know if I would consider myself a millennial. I mean, I'm, I'm 33 years old, but I, I can't pay to watch other people play video games, but it, <laughs> it is a huge, a huge thing going on right now. I mean, it's it's insane. So we're going to seat about thirty five hundred people at this arena, and you know, it's it's insane, man. It's insane. People are going to be coming in and watching other people play uh, play video games. Yeah, the kids are eating this stuff up. They love it. They love it, and it's crazy. It's insane. But yeah, we we just invested about fifty million. We're excited about it. I can't wait to check it out. It's, it's the nation's first, and we're doing it. Yeah. Silly. I'm sure you're going to start seeing those, those things pop up everywhere. That'll be super cool. All right, let's switch gears a little bit, go over to get to know Victor from a personal standpoint. If you were to shoot back to your 25-year-old self, you mentioned you were 33, so maybe we go back a little bit earlier, that 21, 22-year-old self. What advice would you give that individual based on where you're at today? It's very simple. No one gives a shit about how you feel until you win. So go out and win. Don't worry about your feelings. Because no one else does. Love it. Yeah, we're going to keep it nice and simple like that. I mean, that's just that's the truth bomb right there. Oh, yeah. All right. Cool. And uh, and I'm sure books or other things have changed your views on, on different things or led you in the direction that you've been. Uh, what books have you gifted the most to other people or have changed your thought process in how you've gone about your everyday life? Yeah, I got to say the the one book that really changed just my whole mindset and I, I think it changed it changed the trajectory of my life is I was when I was in my late teens, I want to say 16, 17, I was literally on the road to nowhere, right? I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do with my life. I was in a dead end relationship, like I was doing really bad in school, like I, I was never a good student. And I was working at Sephora. So I don't know if you if you know Sephora, the old uh, where they sell they used to, I don't know if they still sell men's cologne, but I really just went worked there for the chicks. But um, <laughs> but I was, I was basically just spraying testers, at having helping guys out with their cologne, and some some dude came up to me. seemed seemed very wealthy. I remember he was wearing a pair of Ferragamo leather shoes and a matching belt and a nice custom suit. And I was like, wow, this guy looks successful. He came up to me and he said, you, you know, we just developed a relationship. He used to come in there every once in a while. He knew my name. I knew him by name. And one day he came in and gave me the book, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And it's one of the oldest business books of all time. And those principles that are in that book still still lie today. I mean, I forget what, what year it was. Around. I think it was like in the 1920s. But the principles still hold true today. And that, that book really changed the way that I think about life in general. And that, you know, you, with the power of your mind, you can literally do whatever the heck you want, right? So I, I, I think that's the, the, the book that I would recommend that anybody buy, especially their first business book. 
Awesome, awesome, good stuff. Definitely a book I've uh, read a couple of times, and it's definitely always one that you go back to and just uh, catch up on. The next question I have to do with uh, charitable organizations, charities at Domain were heavily involved from all the way from the high school, middle school level to the college, county college, state colleges level, different organizations that we support. Wondering if you yourself support any specific charity you'd like to give mention to so people here in the Northeast can learn more about, or maybe uh, Comcast supports. What uh, organizations do you like to uh, talk about or support? Yeah, I'd say Comcast Cares Day is a big, is the one day out of the year that I I think like 90% of all the employees across the country get together and create some type of lasting impact in the community, whether it's painting a school or a homeless shelter or gardening in a local park, but giving back um, of our days and times to uh, to the local community. Comcast Cares Day is is really one of those... uh, organization and foundations that I'm really passionate about. Great. And what uh, time of year does that typically happen that day? Is it around the same time? It's funny. I think it's like next week. <laughs> okay, there we <laughs> go. It's, it's next week. Yeah. So it's 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 usually that, that second, that, the, the, the second weekend of April. Yep. This past weekend. Awesome. And who is a thought leader, innovator, maybe everyday practitioner in the Northeast that our audience should know about or dive deeper into understanding what that person's doing here uh, and they can gain some value from? I got to say, man, you're probably not going to want to hear this, but I'm going to say Rashad. Rashad Bajwa. <laughs> I mean, the CEO of Domain, all the things you guys are doing with biz ratings and Domain. And I know he you guys are doing a lot of work with the with the colleges and NJBIA, and I know he's a partner at the Boys and Girls Club of Mercer County. But I love what you guys are doing in the community, man. So I would definitely go follow Rashad if you have it. Outstanding, good stuff. That's a second mention. We got to uh, really? maybe prerequisite <laughs> that. <laughs> well, that's a beautiful thing, right? Yeah, that's good stuff. All right, great. If uh, people want to learn more about yourself and the company, where where should we point them? Yeah, I mean, um, you can follow me on, on any social media platform, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It's just Victor W. Cardona at all of those platforms. And then Comcast Business is the same thing, Comcast Business uh, at Twitter and at LinkedIn. Great. Awesome stuff. Well, Victor, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing some of these nuggets with our audience. I think there's a lot of people out there that are going to learn more about what it looks like from an internet service provider and the different solutions that you guys are are seeing and servicing to the clients here. So thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. And good luck with everything. Thank you. All right. Talk to you. Take care. Bye-bye. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in iTunes or your favorite podcast player. This guarantees that every episode will get delivered directly to your device. To help us get the word out, share with a friend, leave a review, and check out our discussions on the web at go-domain.com slash podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.